So thank you to everybody for joining us uh, at uh, this last, but definitely not least of the panels of the day. We had a very full day, a very fruitful day, and uh, a very interesting day with a packed agenda. And we are concluding our first day with a panel on one of the most, uh, I would call it uh, hottest topics of the industry, a new trend, the opportunities in the offshore uh, wind value chain. Uh, this particular session, uh, which will run for an hour, is composed of two segments. We will start with Daniel Pilarski, a partner at Watson, Farley and William. And uh, he is going, uh, and Williams, and he's going to uh, give us a presentation, an introductory presentation on the offshore wind market. And then we have a panel discussion uh, arranged by Clarkson's, uh, and we will go into a roundtable discussion on the sector. So, Daniel, thank you very much for being with us. Without any further delay, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you to Watson, Fari, and Williams for uh, for being with us today. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, as Nicholas said, we have a fantastic panel coming up. Um, but before the panel, I'm just going to be giving a very high level and broad overview of the offshore wind market. I'm going to be talking about offshore wind generally. I'm going to be talking a, a little bit about the financing of offshore wind. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the shipping aspects of offshore wind, uh, focusing on the Jones Act, uh, as well as some ship finance uh, aspects. So with that said, let's get started. Uh, so in many ways, offshore wind is similar to onshore wind, which is similar to any other you know, major project uh, project finance or power plant. Uh, you have the developers, suppliers, service providers, off taker and financing. Uh, you have a few interesting aspects of offshore wind uh, in that you have water rights issues. Uh, and obviously because it's uh, uh, wind energy, you have uh, sometimes certainly in Europe, a, a green certificate certifying that this is good environmentally conscious, conscious energy. Um, but otherwise it's, it's a lot of the same types of things. Um, with that said, I wanted to talk at least a little bit about some of the project finance aspects of offshore wind. Uh, really, I'm going to talk about three levels of finance. The first and, and, and the most basic and obvious would be standard project finance bank loans. Um, this would be a bank loan made to the actual project company. Uh, you would, the, the lender would typically get security over uh, both the project assets, such as the wind turbines and all the other transmission network and everything owned by the project, uh, as well as the long-term contracts, uh, so that effectively the loan is really secured by the project and the project revenues. Um, you can sometimes have a loan just for the construction phase, just for the startup phase, uh, or sometimes you have the loan outstanding for the entire operation, and of course you can have uh, uh, mix and match and have different elements. Uh, there are times when the loan can be backed by an export credit agency guarantee. Uh, so for example, you might have uh, a country who's uh, uh, with a factory that produces wind turbines uh, and pursuant to an, to an arrangement, uh, that country's ECA will back a loan so, so long as the project company agrees to purchase wind turbines from that country's factory. One interesting difference between uh, offshore wind and say a traditional power plant uh, is pre-completion revenues. So a traditional power plant, you're in the, the construction phase uh, and you're not doing anything, you're not generating any revenues and then you finish, you uh, uh, flick the switch and now you start producing energy. Um, with offshore wind, as soon as the first wind, wind turbine is installed and connected to the grid, you can actually start producing energy. So during the construction phase, you, uh, uh, you're actually making money. And there's an interesting question as to who gets these pre-completion revenues. Is it the lender? Is it the project developer? Is it some other party? Uh, and this is of course something that, uh, 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 that is definitely to be negotiated among the relevant parties. I wanted to take just a minute to talk about uh, tax equity, uh, at least as it applies here in the US. Uh, so for, for a long time, for well over a decade, we've had uh, two main types of wind credits uh, wind tax credits. We have production tax credits and investment tax credits. Uh, production tax credits, PTCs, uh, are a credit for the production of energy. Those are typically taken over the life of the wind farm. 
uh, as opposed to investment tax credits, which are mostly taken uh, uh, just during the construction and development phase. That's that's really just for the, the construction of the of the wind farm. Um, in addition to credits or, or separate from credits, you also have the potential for very large depreciation deductions. Uh, obviously, these are very uh, uh, wind farms are very capital intensive, uh, and you have the potential to take very large depreciation, especially under uh, the current rules where you, you get at least potentially 100% uh, write-off of all your capital costs uh, in, in the year in which they're incurred. So that can be a very, uh, a, a very nice tax benefit. Um, the, the wind credits uh, have always, uh, 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 they've always been scheduled to, to expire and every few years they get extended. Uh, it's never clear when they'll actually expire. Uh, for a long time, uh, people thought they would they would finally expire for good in 2020, but they've now been extended yet further. Um, and one interesting aspect, uh, as part of the flurry of legislation in, in December of last year, what we saw was that the, the ITC um, was extended to offshore wind, but not to onshore wind, uh, for offshore wind facilities placed in service through 2025. So you now have this real difference between offshore and onshore wind uh, where, where you're going to continue getting these benefits for offshore wind for at least several years to come. Um, but of course, both the, uh, all of these remain to be seen as to what Congress chooses to do. Uh, and finally, just uh, uh, half a minute on, on back leverage and mezzanine debt. Uh, another aspect of, of, uh, of finance you can have is, is mezzanine debt, where essentially you're not lending directly to the project company, but you're lending to an upper tier entity and you're repaid out of project flows. Switching to the really the shipping aspects, um, there are two major types of ships that service uh, offshore wind. There's wind turbine installation vessels. Um, these are, are, are frequently highly bespoke, uh, depending on the function in the project. Uh, very generally, these can both carry and install turbines. Uh, they're self-elevating, so in some, way, in some ways they're like an oil jackup rig. Um, but they're also self-propelled, uh, typically. Yeah, so, so unlike a, a typical jackup rig, they can actually move and transport the turbines to and from uh, locations. Uh, there are roughly 16 of these globally right now, um, but more are currently being built. Uh, the second main type of relevant vessels are, I, I'd say, generally supply vessels. There are lots of different types of vessels, uh, service operation vessels, et cetera. And the panel might talk a little bit more about that. Um, they're not quite as bespoke as the WTIVs, but they can be dedicated to the project. I wanted to spend just a minute talking about the Jones Act, which is certainly relevant for US offshore wind. Uh, so what is the Jones Act? The Jones Act is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Uh, and very generally what the Jones Act says is if, uh, if a vessel is transporting merchandise uh, by water from between two points within the United States, both of those are important terms, um, that vessel must be Jones Act compliant. And what that means very generally is that the vessel is built and flagged in the US uh, and is uh, 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 owned and operated generally by, by US citizens subject to, uh, to some specifics. So uh, a few key questions there. First of all, is a US offshore wind for farm uh, the United States for purposes of the Jones Act? Well, you might think the, the answer is obviously yes. Uh, most wind farms are either close offshore or more likely a little bit further offshore in the outer continental shelf, which extends maybe a couple hundred yard, uh, a, a, a couple hundred miles uh, off of the, uh, the US shoreline. Um, so, so they would certainly be there. Uh, traditionally, I think most people thought that they certainly were considered part of the US for this purpose, but it was never entirely clear. Uh, so in just in December, uh, as part of that flurry of legislation that I mentioned earlier, uh, they changed the law and they made it they, they made it clear that uh, wind farms were subject to U.S. jurisdiction. And only in just January of 2021, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection finally and conclusively determined that, yes, indeed, uh, offshore wind farms are subject to the Jones Act. Uh, another question, what is merchandise? So merchandise generally is, is cargo or is what you might think of as cargo. Um, but there has been a long standing exception for vessel equipment. Um, which is very generally you know, the types of things that are for the vessel, not for transporting the vessel. So you know, things that are actually used or can be used on the vessel. Um, there has been a ruling practice going back to the 1970s where in addition to looking at the actual 
equipment or, or, or the product itself. Um, you, you look at how this product is used and whether it serves the mission of the vessel. So you can't almost have an excuse and say, well, this could be used for the vessel and therefore it's vessel equipment. Um, in, in 2019, just uh, uh, a couple years ago or a little over a year ago, uh, CBP revoked that entire set of rulings. So we're now in a world of uncertainty where we're back to, we're not entirely clear what is or is not vessel equipment and therefore what does or does not qualify for an exception from the, from the Jones Act. With all that said, uh, uh, we now have a new administration and uh, President Biden, at least publicly, has expressed support for the Jones Act. Uh, so the results remain to be seen, um, but I think it's reasonable to expect uh, that there will be a, a, a generally strict reading of the Jones Act under the Biden administration. And what that might mean is there will be relatively few exceptions for a non-Jones Act vessel to deliver goods from the US to a wind farm. Uh, are there any Jones Act WTIVs? Currently, no. Uh, there is one that we understand is under construction for Dominion Energy uh, to be named the Caribdis. Uh, for whatever reason, many of these WTIVs have, are named after legendary sea creatures like the Kraken or the Leviathan or the Hydra. They're monstrously large, I don't know. Um, there is also a consideration being given to the conversion of existing Jones Act vessels that may be turned into WTIVs. Um, and finally, and uh, uh, one just interesting question on the Jones Act is, uh, if you have a WTIB that is at the wind farm and isn't transporting the turbines, but is just installing the, ver the, the turbines, there's a question of whether that installation needs to be Jones Act qualified. Um, I think a lot of people think that it probably doesn't, but there's still at least some uncertainty in that area. Uh, in just the last uh, a few minutes that I have, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, vessel finance as it pertains to, uh, uh, to wind farms. Uh, so here you really have roughly three or four, depending, uh, relevant parties here. You have the vessel lender, uh, you have the vessel owner who borrows, you also potentially have the project lender to the extent that there is a project lender. Uh, and finally, you have, of course, the charterer slash developer. Now, because these vessels uh, are so bespoke, both certainly the WTIVs and, and to some extent also the, uh, the service vessels, um, they're funded on something between a traditional vessel finance basis and a project finance basis. because they're, they're kind of in between there. So for example, in terms of uh, a guarantee and, uh, and recourse, uh, typically, the vessel owner might argue that because the, the payments on the, on the ship finance loan are really going to be funded out of the project revenues, you need very limited recourse uh, loan. You, you wouldn't need, for example, a full corporate guarantee making sure that payments are going to be made. Um, the flip side to that is from the standpoint of the vessel lender, uh, uh, they might say that depending on the terms of the charter and depending on the terms of the loan, it's quite possible uh, that the charter will finish, the, the vessel will, uh, will no longer be used on this project and the loan will be outstanding and therefore they're really going to want some sort of support. Uh, so there's, you, we really see some tension there uh, between the borrowers and the lenders. Uh, another interesting and important issue is client enjoyment agreements. Uh, so here it's obviously very important to the project, to the developer, to all the project parties that the, that the WTIV continue in use uh, even if the owner defaults. So you don't want an owner default and suddenly the lender says, well, the owner is defaulting because they're in bankruptcy and now I'm no longer going to allow my vessel to service your project. The flip side is of course that the vessel lender also doesn't really want to have to go and figure out what to do with this vessel or unlike a, a traditional vessel, it may be very hard to, to just foreclose upon and then market or sell off this vessel. They're, they're highly bespoke. So the solution is we often see a quiet enjoyment agreement, which is a, a, a direct agreement among the vessel lender, uh, the, the charterer, which means the, the project company, uh, and sometimes to, to the extent there is one, uh, the project lender, where basically you say, if the owner uh, is in default, uh, we're going to continue operating the vessel, uh, we're going to figure out uh, uh, some, some purchaser or some sort of workout, but as long as payments on the charter hire are going to, uh, to be made directly out of the, out of the project, uh, the vessel will continue in place. 
Um, that's it, as I said, and as Nicholas said, we have a fantastic uh, panel coming up. So please stick around. Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great introduction to the session. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, we can uh, make uh, your slides available later on to whoever wants them. <clears throat> and again, thank you yes, to Daniel fine. and to uh, Watson Farley Williams for uh, this introductory uh, session. And now I will uh, turn it over to Turner Holm from Clarksus Plateau Securities. Uh, Turner was uh, uh, the one who put this panel together. I also wanted to thank uh, uh, David. Uh, we started this discussion together and welcome everybody, Mikhail and Nick and uh, Stephen. Uh, so Turner, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, appreciate you uh, inviting us and uh, distinguished panelists uh, for, for this discussion today. Offshore wind is uh, definitely an exciting topic um, for me personally, for this panel, um, for Clarkson's for sure, for the whole maritime industry, really. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, offshore wind is going to be the fastest growing major energy source in the world over the next 10 years. Uh, if you look at current capacity for, for offshore wind, it's currently at about 32 gigawatts, um, which is roughly equivalent to the power consumption of New York City. Uh, this is expected to, uh, to grow about seven to eight times over the next 10 years. If you look at forecasts from Clarkson's, but also from parties like Siemens, from Bloomberg, from the IEA, um, there's a consensus that we're going to see a, a decade of structural growth ahead of us. Um, currently, offshore wind is only about 0.3% of the world's power production. Um, and the potential for offshore wind, as I guess we're going to talk about today, is, 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 is limited really only by the imagination. Um, when you consider uh, the IEA has stated that there are enough um, potential offshore wind sites around the world to power the globe 11 times over. So it's, uh, it's, it's clearly very um, excited. Um, what's driving this is um, lower costs. Uh, which have come down significantly in recent years, such that we're seeing um, delivered cost of energy, which is cheaper um, than um, the alternatives, uh, often from, from coal and gas. Uh, so uh, as we see costs come down, uh, this is what's driving the growth, um, and this is what's creating uh, the opportunities across uh, the value chain. Uh, this enormous expected growth that, that, that we're looking at um, is... Uh, it will necessitate a continuous expansion in the value chain in order to execute on the major projects that are coming up, including along the US East Coast, as we'll talk about. Um, and uh, we'll need to do this in order to continue to drive costs lower to secure the competitiveness of offshore wind uh, as, a, as, as a cheap, clean energy source. So um, enormous amount of opportunities. There are also some threats, which we may touch on. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'll take a quick uh, round uh, of the digital table here and introduce everybody before we get the discussion going. So um, on your screen to my right, you should see Mikkel Glierup, who is the CEO of Cadler AS. So they are a Danish-based um, offshore construction and installation player. They're listed on the main exchange in Oslo. Uh, did that at the end of last year, raising capital. Um, they have been around in the offshore wind business since I believe 2012, so uh, an old hand by offshore wind standards. Uh, so we'll come back to Mikkel, but glad to have him on the panel. Uh, to, to, to Mikkel's right, you'll see Stephen Bolton, who is the, um, the MD of uh, Bibby, uh, Bibby Marine, uh, Bibby Maritime Services, which is a um, uh, offer. They, they have two ships right now in the, um, the service operation vessel space. So basically, these are offshore floating accommodation for, wind shore, uh, for offshore wind farm technicians. Uh, also providing logistics around that service as well. And um, we have Nick Prokopuk from DNV, uh, recently been shortened from DNVGL to DNV. Uh, so glad to have Nick. He's an expert in the US market. He's uh, looking after business development for DNV uh, in the US and helping um, ship owners and companies looking to, to enter um, what is uh, going to be a very exciting market over the next 10 years. So glad to have his expertise here. Um, and in addition, we have uh, David Morant, who is the uh, managing director at Aneti. 
uh, formerly known as uh, Scorpio Bulkers. They have uh, announced their intentions and uh, come quite a long way in terms of um, exiting the dry bulk shipping sector and moving into uh, offshore winds. So surely lots of exciting things to, uh, to come from, from Anetti. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining me. Um, and I guess we'll just go ahead and kick it off. Um, I thought that we might start with the U.S., Nick, just given that uh, many of the participants are um, along the U.S. East Coast, and that's historically where this event has been helped. Tell us what's, uh, what, what's happening um, stateside. So thank you, Turner, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you to Nicholas and Capital Link for this great session today. So the U.S. today, um, as, as we sit here in 2021, has a total of 42 megawatts installed for uh, by, by seven turbines total. And if you look towards the goals for 2030, 2035, by whatever metric you're measuring, it's looking to exceed 25, perhaps 30 gigawatts. So we're talking of, you know, close to a full order of magnitude increase here. Um, so it's a tremendous opportunity, um, especially given, you know, the US um, market lacking specialized tonnage, um, very aggressive targets to achieve in the coming decade what Europe had the luxury of kind of very slowly, very progressively developing over 30 years. So a tremendous opportunity um, in Europe, you know, to get to about 20 gigawatts took its estimate about 500 vessels total. Um, if you look at the US offshore wind market of, of purpose-built vessels, we can count on one hand how many are um, out there or being delivered as we speak. So just a tremendous opportunity lies ahead for in, in this segment here in the US. Sure, and I guess after the election, you're seeing a change in, um, in the way that this has been handled from a regulatory perspective. Um, I mean, because it, there's been a lot of stops and starts in, in, in the US's journey in offshore wind and uh, is uh, are we finally reaching that tipping point, or how do you how do you see kind of moving towards that offshore execution? When are we going to see ships in, in U.S. waters installing turbines? So we've seen some very favorable movements early in the new administration. There's been some movement at Boehm, a new director. There's been permitting has picked up for Vineyard Wind, um, and then and on the seventh or eighth day of in office, we saw the administration issue this executive order. For, uh, to double offshore wind production by 2030. So we're seeing a lot of very favorable movements. And the, the belief is that once the permitting process by Boehm gets firmed up and starts running smoother is when you'll start seeing, you know, capital investments for these bespoke vessels to be built here in the U.S. Um, keeping in mind the, the, the Jones Act requirements for U.S. flag vessels. For sure. It's, it's very exciting. And I'm sure we're going to touch on the U.S. topic as we come. And it's creating opportunities for companies like Mikkel as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on early on in this, in this discussion is, um, is the turbine sizes, right, Mikkel? I mean, they're, <laughs> they're pretty big, right? I mean, for New York-based people, I mean, they're almost getting up to the size of uh, the Chrysler building at the, uh, or the Eiffel Tower, whichever reference point you want to use. It's their, their, their big pieces of a kit. So what is that doing for you in terms of, um, you know, your offshore construction and, and, and installation business? And how, do your, how are your vessels changing to be able to handle these enormous turbines, which of course are leading to lower costs? Uh, but how are you adapting to this change? I think it's, it's uh, there are several steps that we are taking at the moment. I, I certainly agree with you that the turbines are becoming unfathomably uh, big. Uh, and it's something that we, even us who have been in the industry, we, we started in 2008, so we have been here for more than, 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 than the years you mentioned. But nevertheless, I, I think that, um, I think even for us, it's, 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 it's crazy to see how it's gone fast with the turbines and how um, the growth in the turbine size has been exponential. For us, it's all about, um having the vessels we already have uh, that was delivered to us in 2012 and in 2013 uh, and keeping them relevant uh, and ensuring that they can install the equipment until the end of their useful life uh, we have done that by ordering a new crane for the pacific orca with an option for ordering one for the pacific osprey um which is a strategy we have uh, because we, we we certainly see that um in order to match the equipment, there's some, some, some quite drastic steps have to be taken on these vessels. On top of that, we are also, uh, as we have said to the market, we are, we are actively considering to, to, to place an order for a new build, uh, a vessel that will really make a step change in the industry. Because what we see with these bigger turbines is that um, the turbine installation itself and the loading of it and all of that is more or less the same small or big turbine. It's the crane that is the limiting factor here. So the transit 
really becomes the one of the competitive factors. And this is where we we certainly have seen that that there will be a, 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 a real game changer to be made if you if you do this right. And and building in a decade of experience into such an asset is is is, is hugely important. And I would say also, as it was mentioned in the presentation before we started the panel with 16 vessels globally uh, in the fleet, that number comes down very, very fast when you start to see the growth of the turbines, because uh, there's not a lot of assets out there today that are able to handle the turbines we will be installing only a few years ahead of us. Uh, and yeah. that certainly creates uh, one of the one of the many bottlenecks, I would say, that we see, we see in order to, to reach the, the targets that Nick talks about, uh, because these, these are not only targets for the US, we have a similar and more aggressive targets in Europe and, and same in Asia. So, so this is also one of the things we see that it's a, it's a global expansion that we're seeing now and, and, and everybody wants offshore wind. Sure. And, you know, I, I'm glad that you raised the point about, about the way that the turbines are, 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 are sort of narrowing the relevant fleet of, of who's going to be able to compete in the future. Because, you know, I, I think a lot of investors, when they first look at this space, sometimes they look at the order book and it looks maybe, let's say, 50 percent of the current fleet. And, uh, you know, that looks high by, by many other shipping sectors. Of course, we talked about a, a decade of structural growth ahead of us and a lot of that baked in, at least for the next three, four, five years, is these major projects, which has sort of reached their final investment decisions moving forward. It's obviously a big undertaking to, to, to move forward with a, a, an offshore wind farm with several hundred turbines the size of the Chrysler building. But, uh, but you know, what do you, what, how do you look at, you know, the supply that's out there on the water today versus, you know, what you see in terms of, you know, growth opportunities or market opportunities? It, it, it's, it's, um, it sure looks like there's going to be more growth out there in the in the demand than there is in the supply. And and how do you see that playing out in the discussions you're having around tenders a couple of years out in time? I, I certainly agree with that view. Uh, a few comments. Uh, I would say that we, we we see that the market is tightening. We see that the clients are coming to us much earlier now than they did in the past. So traditionally, we saw that clients they were contracting with us two three years in advance. Now we see that they come to us and discuss projects as much as seven, eight years in advance. And, and why is that? That's because um, at that stage, they haven't even done borehole sampling, soil data and all of that at the site. So they're simply shopping from the top of the pyramid in order to risk mitigate because it's multi-billion dollar projects that we're talking about here. And they are basically putting all the eggs in one basket with us, so to speak, because if we can't install, there's no turbine spinning at the end. Um, but but I also from my side, I would like to add a little bit of caution here because uh, we are talking about many different variables and 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 and, and although i'm saying that a lot of the, the current fleet cannot install I, i'm i'm not so eager to discount all of it just now because i, I do believe that there is also um, we see now in the us for example if you can act as a crane platform then you can still maybe install and, and, and uh, in lack of a better word not being a native english speaker I'd circumvent the jones act um so so Let's see, uh, you know, but 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 I believe that it's, it's tightening. I certainly see there's a as there's a there's a big tightening, and and clients are coming out earlier, and they they want to risk mitigate, um, but I, but I don't want to discount everything else than than what is being built today. Sure, agreed. Yeah, and um, I wanted to bring in David on this point as well because David, your company has gone through a, a quite bold transformation and has made a very targeted. Um, strategic decision to move short towards offshore wind. What are some of the, you know, there's obviously the market drivers, which we've gotten into a little bit, but what is, what's the sort of financial perspective that you bring to this industry and, and, and how it's maybe different from some of the other shipping perspectives? It's especially interesting to listen to David on this because he's a former portfolio manager himself. Before you start throwing rotten fruit at me, yes. Uh, no, I, you, you, thank you for the question, Turner. Look, I, it, it, it's a fascinating industry. And as you said, it was really heartening uh, to hear the statistics you gave at the beginning, because I think as an organization, uh, Aneti, um, which we renamed last month, by the way, we got slightly fed up of appearing at conferences as Scorpio Balkas and getting asked if we'd appeared on the wrong panel. Uh, so, you know, it was very clear that we, we took a, a long term view of this. It was a very thoughtful decision to move uh, out of the dry bulk space um, and particularly to embrace, you know, as you said, a, an industry which we think is is growing sort of 20 percent compound, you know, out to the end of the decade. And, and bluntly, that's just the stuff we can see. Um, again, you know, I think like everyone, there was a bit of a sort of bottom of the beer glass moment in March last year when COVID really came 
to to play but at the same time we've seen nothing but the pipeline of uh of, of fields that are coming to be built uh accelerate throughout that period and and i think most particularly it's been supercharged in, in nick referenced the sort of political changes in the us just over the last few months but i think also around the world you've seen huge amounts of sort of green build back better job creation stimulus coming through and you know it's estimated that a million dollars spent in in wind energy um delivers double double the number of jobs that a million dollars spent in uh in fossil fuels will deliver and as you can see on the us continental shelf you're, you're seeing that pivot between the spend in offshore wind eclipsing the spend in oil and gas you know within the middle of this decade so we're right in the process of this migration and i think for us the excitement has been an opportunity we're almost, almost a banner example of it right i mean I think when you're a, a business that relies on at one level or another, moving thermal coal around the world, you, there's a special place in polar bear hell for you. So <laughs> we made a very clear decision that we would take our fleet down. We're down to five ships now and really become part of the solution. I think in doing so, to your question specifically on the finance, I think the interesting thing you think about our organization, you know, what do we do well? You know, that what, what do we bring to this? And I think the thing that we're most excited about is bringing US institutional capital to play in this industry. Um, it's been an industry, you know, Mikkel put me right here, but you know, the first wind farm was built, I think, in 91, Mikkel, in, in Denmark, if I'm correct in saying that. Um, right. so this industry has been around a long time, but actually it's really now coming of age as a meaningful, uh, a meaningful uh, producer and part of the solution that the mm -hmm. world needs in terms of reliable, reliable energy. We bring, you know, 10 years of new build experience, uh, billions of dollars that we put to work specifically in Korean yards. We bring US institutional capital to play. And I think what's really interesting, particularly about our little part of this uh, value chain, we were fairly forensic about the way we approached it because we said, well, look, where can we preserve a position where our investors, you know, demanding US institutions who want to see predictability and sustainability of return for the significant capital risk that they're being asked to take, can, can build a moat of both expertise and of a vessel uh, on the water. Um, there are going to be, as you said, a substantial number of these built, but we certainly feel we have an opportunity to bring these on time, on budget, into Northwestern Europe, into the US. And as I think, you know, Mikhail was mentioning, and Nick, that the, the broader globalization of this industry away from its stronghold in Northwestern Europe. We have enough visibility in the contracts. We've got great contract counterparties as well. And again, over the space of the last year, we've all seen the major energy companies, particularly those in Europe, go through their own transition. You know, and, and we've seen IOCs become IECs um, even within the last round. If you look at the Crown Estate round four in the UK, you've seen Total, BP, Shell, um, the real giants. Um, and again, those who've been around for, for, for much longer in this industry will remember it was uh, five guys in a Regis office with a PowerPoint presentation. It's now really coming of age and, and the billions of dollars that are going into this are, are, are substantial. And with that, as a last point, I'd say, you know, again, back to what we do, the maritime complexity in, in deference to the conference right here is going up. You're going to, to wind farms that are moving, you know, the new rounds are moving an average of 70 kilometers out from 40 kilometers out, higher wind speeds, more persistency, greater sea depth, easier planning. The northeastern seaboard of the US is a lot of that, but you're seeing this becoming a much more uh, maritime, genuine, uh, scalable uh, offshore industry. Uh, and I think, you know, I was talking to one of our investors who's pretty excited, I think, having come from a small mid cap dry bulk stock into this. And, and he said, look, as, as we explained this to him, you know, you've really got to go back to the 1970s, in the Gulf of Mexico to see a, an industry which is which is coming of age of this magnitude, uh, particularly in the context of, of the US offshore build. So I'd like to sure. think, you know, we're right. We're here at the right time in the right place in terms of our transition. And we've got a lot to do, but it's ahead of us. No, absolutely. And I appreciate the comments in the, in the, in the context from the sort of um, uh, capital markets perspective. I also wanted to bring in Stephen here, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the service operation vessel, the SOV uh, part of the market. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about the things that make this business attractive, but I think we should also recognize that all these things that are making attractive are also making it more competitive. 
And Stephen um, and his team were early on in moving in these service operation vessels, which are mostly housing offshore wind technicians uh, to tighten all the bolts and connect the wires offshore and providing offshore logistics. So Steve, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what makes your purpose-built vessels different in doing that compared to say an oil and gas vessel that comes in and tries to do the same job. And then also maybe if you could provide us a bit of perspective on the competition and how that's developing in your part of the market. Yeah, certainly turn around. Um, I think you start with what the vessel's trying to do uh, at its most extreme. And really we're taking a, a human being and taking them 25, if not 30 meters up in the air and then we're taking them a further 30 meters out in the, in the horizontal plane. And if you can imagine standing at that position in free space uh, on a ship moving in the ocean, that takes quite a lot of skill and it takes quite a lot of expertise to, to, to make sure that person's safe, irrespective of whether the gangway is pushed against the structure. And really that safety comes, in my mind, it comes from the hull of the vessel. And our existing stock of vessels that we've used in the oil and gas market are not designed for the same purpose. They're designed for crashing through high waves. Um, they're not designed to sit steady and flat. So really we start from a position with these vessels from, from the actual steel of the hull. It's there to do something very, very different. And it's there to keep a person you know, in quite a perilous place, very, very safe. So you start there and that's the sort of the steel work of the ship, but that, that's not enough. We have to move from turbine to turbine, um, which you know can be one, two, three kilometers in space. We have to be able to put the gangway across. We have to be able to mobilize six to eight technicians across the gangway and be at the next turbine within 30 minutes. And also when we're at the turbine, we need to deploy the crane and put spare parts over. So the whole cycle time that we have to do to ensure that we can get to sufficient turbines each day or each morning and then retrieve the technicians back in the night. That means the efficiencies through the vessel has to be exceptional. So we plan every move that the technicians move through the vessel and the spare parts move. And we even design our vessels, we have a phrase which is stepless and slopeless. So a technician or a spare part moving through our vessel from the point they put their overall on or the point they're put in a trolley ready to go to the, that's the um, spare part, not the technician from the point they start their journey, they will never go up a step or never go up a slope in our vessel. So they are moved through using elevators and horizontal floor spaces. And that is all about pure efficiency. And then I think the final one is when the people have done their work, they're on that vessel for two, two weeks usually, a rotation for a technician. The comfort they need, they, you know, that hotel feel, uh, this is not, again, oil and gas workers on a ship that then get deployed onto an offshore accommodation module. These people are actually living in our vessel. So they need that relaxation time. They need that time to recover. They also, from a sort of human brain point of view, they're living on a moving structure. They're working on a fixed structure and they're repeating this cycle on a daily basis, which, again, one of the only ways the body can sort of cope with that is making sure those comfort levels when they are back in the vessel, that time to relax, that time to chill out. We have saunas in these vessels. We have gyms, uh, multi-stack gyms. You know, our, the vessel behind me is a two-story stack gym with a sauna facility. So, so there are a lot of things, you know, right down from the technical scale through how the vessel is designed internally to the comfort. But there's a final aspect, and that's, again, maybe two aspects. It's, the word I would use is integration. Everything in the vessel is integrated, whether it's a gangway, whether it's a crane system, the elevators that move people. But we also have an awful lot of systems that control how we can access, when we can access. You can see the um, gangway tower over my shoulder, the height of it. That actually becomes within a conflict zone with the wind turbine blades. So we need systems that measure control and make sure that, you know, that those collisions can't happen. Equally, the amount of data points we record from moving the gangway across the structures, how we monitor the safety of people so we can go back and replay everything. And that basically means on these vessels, in our vessels, we have digital twins working daily on the vessels, taking forecast information, working out if we can access, whether we can't access, when's the best time. So there's all this integrated technology. And that, the final point that I'd make is 
that then means our crew have to be integrated. This is not about a marine crew driving a vessel and some technicians from a separate company. This is an entire integrated system of people, uh, people, equipment, control software, everything working together in unison to make sure this all happens. So maybe a long answer to your question. Sure. These are complicated vessels that need to work perfect because if they don't work perfect, those technicians don't get onto the structure. And it only takes the smallest point of all those things I mentioned to break down and the system doesn't work. So sure. That, that's, that's a long answer to your first question. I guess the second one, yes, it's a competition. I think these are attractive. Um, you know, we typically would win a 10 year contract to support the purchase of one of these vessels. We have a steady income coming from, you know, blue chip name. Of course, this is a competitive market. You know, who wouldn't want to be in it? But I guess the risk there is we're also quite low down the supply chain. You know, people come to us quite late in the process. And that means we can get squeezed. You know, we're all here to reduce the cost of offshore wind. We all want to lower the cost and we're all working towards that. But an awful lot of decisions are made before people come to us. And that combined with this increased you know, competition that we're now seeing in tenders can lead to potentially you know, my goal of deploying the right technology for the job. I think there, you could possibly argue there's a little bit of threat coming towards that purely from a price point. Sure. I mean, I think it builds on the theme that David and, and, and Mikkel both address with regards to the maritime complexity that's involved. Um, but anytime there is a tenure contracts, I guess uh, it's always going to attract a, attention. Um, lots of uh, historically um, offshore and, and, and maritime shipping companies also have, have been looking at this space. But one of the things I wanted to do to make sure we get time to talk about, because it, it, we have about 15 minutes left on the panel, is, is and I'll leave this as a bit of an open question um, because everyone I think has their own perspective on this. And that's really about technology and especially balancing you know, capital decisions um, here uh, because you can spend as much money as you want and come up with a great solution. But obviously we all have to, at the end of the day, show a P&L and a cash flow statement. Um, uh, I, really it's about, I guess, propulsion um, in fuel usage. Uh, offshore wind is the most exposed perhaps of all the various maritime sectors when it comes to new technologies coming in with regards to propulsion. It's really a test case in many ways for other parts of, of, of the maritime value chain, uh, just given who the customers are, right? They're producing clean power at the end of the day and they care about uh, the carbon footprint and the emissions of, of their value chain. I don't know if anyone particularly wants to jump in. Um, uh, really anybody. Uh, Nick, right, you're working. Yeah. Do you want to go kick, kick us off? Just there for me, but I'll go again. Um, we're, we're currently running a sort of half a million pound research grant on behalf of the UK government. And that's really looking at this fuel burn because you're absolutely right. We're, we're working in a renewable energy industry uh, on green wind turbines, and there we are burning fuel oil. Um, it is complex for offshore vessels, mainly because of our endurance. Uh, we're working 30 days offshore, or certainly at least two weeks offshore. And that, that presents a great challenge for alternative fuels. Uh, you know, even liquefied hydrogen poses huge problems, uh, which seems to be the, the, you know, the fuel of choice. Um, battery power is, doesn't work in an SOV. It, it has a role in SOVs in terms of what we call peak shaving and emergency support. But this is a real big challenge to our industry about where are we going in terms of greening these vessels. We already have greened them. So these vessels that go in behind me will burn probably be about a half or a third of what a typical oil and gas vessel will. And again, that's because we understand how it operates in the water and the exact location where it needs. Sure. But the future fuel chest question is a real challenge. And you know, there's a lot, a lot of bright minds working on it. Absolutely. And something that everyone with a new build project has to think about. Um, Mikkel, do you want to jump in here? You all have, uh, I'm sure, been working on this. How do you green a, a monster like you have behind you? Uh, for people's perspective, uh, these are uh, 250 to 300 million dollar ships. They're big pieces of kit and uh, I've been on board. They're, uh, they're, they're big boats. How do you green a ship like that? Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's first of all it's about analyzing where actually do you spend your, your your consumption, so to speak. Where do you have consumption, and what is your consumption profile? And we have certainly done that, and we have we have analyzed that in detail, and we have come up now with kind of like broken it down to several di different categories where we can 
use alternate fuels in combination with the with with let's say the more traditional fuel types uh, and really bring down um, um, the whole footprint of the asset over its lifetime. Um, so, so that's one side of it to look at really the consumption patterns and when do you have consumption, but also look at you know how can you operate this vessel with alternate fuel types because it is batteries for example is offering a totally different. Uh, opportunity to the vessel compared to traditional diesel engines. Um, and then also it's about uh, discussing with the clients. And I think that um, we, we have discussed uh, prior to the panel a little bit around, you know, barriers to entry. And I think that one of, you know, the one, one thing is for me, you know, having been here for a decade and not having been here, because we know the clients and we are already in talk with our clients about this. What are they thinking with this? You know, where can they add something? Because obviously if you have to carry all of it, then you are limited to something and, and probably the best way to save fuel is to ask the master to, to be very careful about how he spends fuel. This is probably the very best method at all. Um, but the clients are obviously working on this as well. The ports are working on it. Things are happening day by day. And, and I think that, that, that that's really where I, I, I see that there is um, a lot of common interest in the industry that, that clients, us, ports, everybody, we are working together to, to kind of like solve this this problem because I do agree that this is something that has a lot of focus and where a lot of things is happening. Sure. And going to be probably a key competitive um, uh, dynamic going forward. Uh, I'd like to, to touch on, 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 on barriers to entry. It's a question we get a lot um, from investors that are looking at this space, but I'm going to give David and Nick a chance to weigh in on the, uh, the technology issue. Um, feel free to jump in. Um, Nick, you want to jump in, David, go for it. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I mean, exactly what Stephen said, you know, um, you have a, a vessel like behind Stephen here that's operating on DP in the field, that's making 10, 12, maybe 14 connections per day with workers transferring across at this great height across this great distance. Um, you know, so the risk associated with that activity, uh, how frequently that, that's happening is very high. With that, you know, digitalization is key. Uh, and decarbonization, I think what we need to talk about next is the, the angle of decarbonization. Uh, these wind turbines are part of the great electrification that's ongoing right now, and that will catch up to these vessels themselves as well. Uh, battery packs are becoming kind of standard these days for peak shaving in the future, um, you know, zero carbon, low carbon fuels. So we heard about, you know, testing of ammonia, of hydrogen type systems. Um, We've seen some concepts of charging out in the field, even, you know, for very future, future forward thinking. But I think for an owner today, I'm talking about a barrier into the market. An owner today, today needs to des design and build a vessel that will be desirable and able to get work perhaps five, 10 years from now. Um, potential of carbon taxes coming into this segment. And, and, you know, last thing any owner wants to have is a vessel that will not be favorable or, or be able to get work due to it being um, not decarbonized. For sure. Uh, David, I'll, 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 I'll let you answer on the, on the technology part, but I also want to ask about barriers to entry as a new entrant in the market to yourself, uh, yourselves. Um, it's a lot of money for one of these ships. They're, uh, they're expensive. I guess that's one of the, uh, one of the answers. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, both the capital markets and, 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 and the banking world or the bond market are probably a little bit, um, cautious, uh, given, given the experience in offshore oil and gas in the, in, in the previous, um, cycle, uh, how do you uh, address the technology issue when you think about specking out your new build and, and, and how do you, um, how do you look at barriers to entry as you try to break into this market? How do you how do you overcome them? Yeah, sure. Well, look, I think on the technology side, I mean, you'll probably be relieved to hear there's mines much better than mine internally looking at that issue. And I suppose one of the benefits of starting with a blank sheet of paper is exactly that. You can start with your blank sheet of paper and sort of build it up and build it down and break it and stretch it. And I think as, as Nick and Steve and, and Mikel have suggested, it's hard, you know, it, this is hard. Um, there's some significant engineering questions which need to be asked in building these vessels anyway. You know, the real just basic sort of variable load, you've got vessels in our space that jack up once every 24, 48 hours. That's really a, a whole nother level of jacking system beyond what you'd have seen in oil and gas. Um, you have to have, as, as, as the others mentioned, a, a, a turning, 
uh, an ability to carry a certain amount of machinery out to the field and you know 120 ex expensive um, guys and girls in our case in, in relative comfort so it's a really uh, you know the 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 uh, green credentials of the shed are far from being an afterthought. They're absolutely integrated into the solution that you're providing for your charter. But I would say just to your question in terms of barriers to entry, look, it's always hard when you say no one else could do it. <laughs> um, so we're not presumptive about that. And I think we, we, we look at the current incumbents uh, and the people who are also looking at the market and we've got huge respect for them. I mean, I should add, it, it's really got to go some. I mean, Nick mentioned, you know, there's one wind turbine installation vessel being built in the U in the US for the Jones Act. If you calculate those growth numbers that were discussed at the top of the call, you need one turbine installed in the US every day, every single year between now and the end of the decade, just to hit those kind of numbers. So it gives you a, a kind of a feeling for what the the relative level of, of under provision is. I think to your point about the financial characteristics that we can provide a certain amount of financial visibility but these aren't vessels which are going to get you know aside from the top down setup they're not going to give you 10 15 year contracts and by the way thank god for that because if if you did you know park avenue would already have come along and effectively arbitrage those returns away to to low mid single digit so we think you know when you look at the, the financial setup here for us we think it's a great slot for public equity participants particularly us institutional participants you've got a really nice gap between short-term volatile unpredictable returns that's that's really where we come from in the spot uh, commodity shipping market so we, we we've got the t-shirt on that one and yet you've got a really nice top-down uh, trend that you can identify and that's clearly investable uh, in other stocks and you've got here an opportunity which has very close adjacency to that in a materially underserviced part of the entire growth space you know Orsted when they were asked you know what's the biggest challenge to the U.S. wind build out said you know the maritime supply supply chain and within that it is the wind turbine installation vessels and so you're getting into a space uh, much overused analogy around gold mines and picks, but you're effectively selling the machinery for people to go and, or the service for people to go and install the wind farm. And I think when you put that package together, the degree of visibility you have around that and the growth trajectory for it is a really exciting opportunity for public equity investors to get involved in, in, a, in companies that I think can deliver much more sustainable returns than many of the public shipping companies in a growth trend, which is really clearly identifiable. So to your specific question on the barriers to entry, look, I, as I said to you right at the beginning, we had a good old think about, you know, what are we, what are we good at? And it was a slightly longer conversation than we hoped it would be, but we did have a good old think about this as an organization. And I think what's very clear when you're an organization that's got 60 years of pedigree, eight and a half thousand people that's built and ordered, you know, more than $10 billion worth of new tonnage and put together the export credit arrangements that, that, uh, that were referenced right at the top by Dan, you know, you can see some of the expertise that comes to getting these sophisticated vessels on time, on budget, uh, on the water uh, for those demanding uh, demanding clients. And I think that is a barrier to entry. What I would then say is, look, if you look at what we're looking to build as a, as a new entrant, we really believe this is the point of the acceleration. So we're, we're very purposeful about what we're doing at this stage. Uh, we think incumbency as we manage to build it. And as I say, that we're very respectful of those who already have. Uh, but we'd like to join them and, and as I say, provide uh, opportunities for US institutional investors to, to really play a significant role in the build out of a very underserviced part of the maritime sector. And, and in itself, um, that, that is in itself for us the barrier to entry. Thanks, thanks, David. And and I wanted to pick up um just as a, in a remaining couple minutes, I uh, just wanted to pick up on on one of your your comments. And I think a theme that um kind of runs through this discussion is um uh, at least with the capital markets perspective is perhaps the state sustainability of returns, right? Either due to the long term demand outlook, perhaps an undersupply, or perhaps because the business is just a little bit different than some of the other. Uh, maritime and shipping businesses, given that that complexity that we're dealing with. So I just wanted to take a quick round around the table and ask everybody one um, very simple question, and I hope I'm not being too flippant, but uh, how are you going to make money? Um, I think uh, it's it's obviously an exciting market. Um, it's a place where there is uh, it is attracting a lot of attention from 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 new entrants, from traditional shipping players, but also um, from various other parts of, of the supply chain. Maybe I'll start with you, uh, Mikkel. How are you going to make money? I think that we are we are going to make money by making the right decisions from the start, you know. And I think that we have proven that 
uh, on on the vessels we delivered already. You know, they are still working, uh, and they were built as kind of like in in the bulk of where the, these vessels were delivered in the global fleet. And I think that we we have we have worked very very hard for for eighteen months to 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 design what we call the X class vessel, um, and um, and I think that. That will be a big component in it uh, that we know that the vessels we deliver they can keep operating until the end of their useful life uh, we, we, we we as much as we can try to to avoid the obsolescence trap uh, by sure. growing component sizes and and, and and second part of it is also about making the right decisions we don't we don't want to get ahead of ourselves so for us it's all about making uh, not only what we do on the water with oil and, and, and with batteries and with hydrogen and all that sustainable, it's also to make sustainable business decisions. So we, we work closely with our existing clients. Clients we have serviced well for 10 years and we are looking at, 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 at really being selective about what contracts, you know, what regions we want to go into, what partnerships we want to go into because a lot of new regions, it's not unique for the US that there is a cabotage regime. You know, we see that everywhere we go. Taiwan is, is, is big on this, Japan as well. So it's all about making the right decisions in terms of partners and all of that. So, so the foundation for growth is very strong and that we have something that we can build out on uh, rather than trying to be uh, opportunistic on a case-by-case -case basis. Excellent answer. Steven, you want to jump in? How do you make, uh, Bibi, how do you make money at Bibi? <laughs> well, I think our, our motto at the moment is sort of designed to be different and we try to be different, we try to differentiate and we believe in the fact that we brought a different vessel with superior performance and I think that's key and despite what I saw or said at the end of my, my first soapbox um, piece, if, if there is a sort of current challenge because of economics against that, I actually think the other thing which we do is, is sort of transparency of data, we hide nothing. We show every data point we collect in the vessel to the clients through a particular piece of software. And I believe that that being different, being transparent, the data will make sure that we, we stay in this industry long time. Because I say, even if there's a blip where people chase after cheaper tonnage, I think the evidence will come back that that's not the right decision. Uh, differentiating, keeping the access levels high. And I think the market will respond to that because that's exactly what the market needs. You have some nice ships as well. I like the uh, I like the no slope. You don't have to take one extra step. Uh, Nick, how do you advise your clients to make money in the U.S.? It's a it's a it's a market with its own peculiarities, regulatory and otherwise. What's uh, what's the key? Um, it's it's again the, the same thing I've mentioned. It's a a safe ship, a smart ship, and a green ship. Um, we're we're here to help you know fellow panelists here and, and among many others to have the safest, smartest, and greenest vessel that will deliver profits to them and to their customer. Um, that's what we're here for, to help, you know, like I mentioned, we 500 vessels to build offshore wind in Europe. Um, we're at single digits in the US right now. Um, so that's what we're here for, to help, you know, people do that, safer, smarter, and greener. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, David, you answered this question to some degree, but I'll let you, I'll give you a, a quick wrap up, wrap up to, for the panel. Well, I suppose in our in our particular case, as I said, it, it, it's some it, it's a much higher quality return. It's a much more visible and durable return than we've had in the past. But I think the other thing I'd say is, you know, here in, in with a conference that's virtual, but you know, normally in New York, you know, I think that it, it's very clear the relevance of this industry, particularly to where our shareholders sit, and that we believe we'll be able to deliver returns that the market will re-rate. We believe we're effectively a, a service provider to one of the highest growth industries in the world. And I think that deserves a, a multiple uh, well in excess of, of the conventional multiples we've endured as, as, a, as a commodity shipping player. And so I think within that context, it's, it's, it's getting great tonnage, but delivering it on time, on budget, into those charters, reducing their time to first power, which is anyone who's done a DCF on one of these fields will attest is one of the most sensitive uh, variables and just being there time and time again as this industry globalizes and particularly and most excitingly in this context as the US builds out, you know, what's surely one of its most uh, exciting and unexplored energy resources. Amen. Okay, well, uh, I guess that's going to do it for this panel. Speaking of on time and on budget, we're exactly at one hour. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who uh, participated on the panel. So Nick Prokopuk from uh, from DNV, uh, Mikkel Glearup from uh, 
Cadler, also listed in Oslo. Um, David Morant from uh, Aneti, listed in New York. Stephen Bolton from, from Bibi uh, Marine. And uh, thank you as well, Nicholas, uh, for, for, for setting this up. Well, thank you very much from my end. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Daniel uh, Pilaski from Martin Filey and Williams. I think Daniel is still with us. If you want to turn your camera on. Uh, thank you to everybody for being with us. Um, decarbonization is clearly, I think, one of the critical topics and uh, the industry that you are all uh, engaged is one of the fastest growing uh, industries. So in closing, I'd like to thank you all. Also, I'd like to make uh, two announcements. Uh, we are going to host a, a decarbonization conference on April 14 and a Jones Act conference in May, in, in June. So maybe we'll have the opportunity to talk again. So thank, thank you me. again. Really, it's been a great panel. And you know, this is so, so new, so growth oriented. Uh, it's the future. And the future starts from the present now. So thank you. Thank you.